Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever part of the world you're in right now. This is Carla from Rehan Alawala's World of Connections, and I am here today to talk to Nakom Katz. I'm not sure that I said his name right, but I'm trying very hard. I'll explain his name in a few moments. And I want to remind you that we are sponsored by the Institute of Peace, which is an online organization promoting peace one conversation at a time. Nakon, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, Carla, and uh, thank you very much. And thanks the Institute of Peace for generating and organizing that. And thank you for all the efforts that you are making to bring uh, friendships uh, in the world and uh, from many corners of the world. And uh, thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. Um, I am uh, Nahum Katz, I was not born Nahum Katz, but uh, my name is Nahum Katz, I live in Israel, not far from uh, the center. Not for a moment, what do you mean you weren't we're not born Nakom Katz. Uh, well, I mean that I was born something else. <laughs> I was I was born uh, Gheorghe Andrei Constantin in Romania, and I became Nakom Katz when I came to Israel in 1970 as a 14 year old boy. Hmm. In fact, the truth is that uh, my my family name was changed only in 1974, formally, because you could not do it unless you are of age uh, 18. So the first thing that my mom did when we came to Israel is uh, together with my uh, brother, she changed our names. And formally, I, uh, I uh, became cats only when I was 18. But, um, uh, why Nahum and why Katz? Katz is uh, a two pieces of acronym of a name that have to do with the Jewish Jewish clergy in the old ancient temple. So Katz comes from Kohen Tzedek, Ka -tze, Kohen Tzedek, which is the high priest or the pri priest of justice in the old uh, temple that used to be in Jerusalem and that was destroyed. And Nahum is one of the small prophets in the Bible, one of the books of the Bible of the Old Testament. And uh, the meaning, uh, the Hebrew meaning is comforted or somebody who's comforted. So, uh, so that's, but, but the, the most important thing is that Katz was my grandfather's name who was uh, killed with many other members of the family in the Holocaust. And Nahum was the name, the Hebrew name of my uncle who was killed in the Ukrainian uh, battalions of uh, forced labor somewhere in Ukraine in World War II. So that's the story of the name. Okay, so where are you? You're in Israel now. Did you grow when you moved to Israel? Did you start in Tel Aviv or? No, I, I started in Beersheba. There is an institution that is called Ulpan. Ulpan is a place to learn language. So we first came to Israel and uh, after meeting and spending some time with family, which for us, it was my mom and uh, my brother and myself, it was uh, discovering a family for the first time in our lives. For my mother was rediscovering her family, but for us it was discovering a family because we grew up in Romania and we had zero family there. So all our family, the, the remainders of our family came to Israel and they were here for 25 years before we were able to, to come out as well. Uh, as we were refused, at least from my time, from the time that I was born, my mom was refused to make Aliyah, to come to Israel for about 14 years. And that's a long story too. So in any case, we went first to Beersheba, a city in the south, 
that's where we studied for four or five months Hebrew. And then she was uh, given to, she went to look for a job. She was a doctor. She was a pediatrician doctor. Uh, she went to look for a job and she found two options. One was in the town of Karmiel in the north, and the other one was in Hadera, which is halfway between Haifa and Tel Aviv. And that's what she decided to go for. And uh, I am very happy that she went to Hadera because otherwise I wouldn't have met my lovely wife. Uh, I met her when I came to, when I first entered class eight of uh, elementary school. And there she was in front of me. And the rest is about this story. So you, you're actually childhood sweethearts. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and married 41 years. Um, have two daughters, three grandkids. Uh, and we're very, very, very good friends. Well, friendship is very important in a marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's the most important part. Yeah. My parents were married 60 some years and they were friends and spent mm -hmm. all that time together as friends. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. so That's that wonderful. It's more important than love more important than money, friendship is a good thing to have. Uh, that's, yeah. That's that's what I love about, about the programs and plans of uh, this institution and Rihan and what you're doing. Creating friendships is a really good thing. I, I have friends that uh, from childhood that I still uh, am good friends with and um, at one of the times, about uh, more than 20, in 1989, I visit. I was a visiting officer in a school in uh, the American Army, and uh, I spent a few months with uh, with some people. And uh, for the rest uh, of the time, until today, we are excellent friends. So friendship, friendship is uh, uh, really a very important thing, and it's very dear. You have to keep it. Thank you, Sarmad. And he loves you. Yeah. It's wonderful. Happy. It's heartwarming. Yeah, it was very heartwarming to see that comment, too. But mm -hmm. that's the important thing. Friendship, not only in marriage, but all around. Um, what do you do in Israel? What kind of work do you do? I... Uh... I was for many years, I was a military personnel. I served in the artillery corps. I never planned to, but I uh, served as a military officer in the artillery corps. And uh, I ended up as a colonel in, uh, in the education corps. In, in the world, there are three or four countries only that among their different uh, branches of army, they have an education core. One of them is Singapore, one of them is, uh, I, I don't remember which others, but one of them is Israel. And from the inception of the State of Israel, from the beginning of the State of Israel, the education core was established by David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister and the uh, father of, uh, of, of the state. <laughs> And um, it was very, very important for him to establish not only artillery, armor, infantry, etc., but also an education corps. And uh, it was a place where people could complete their uh, degree of education if they didn't succeed to do that in the high school or in school before joining. So in any case, I finished my service in 1997 as a full bird, full colonel, a commander of the unit, the main school of education of the IDF. And um, I did many jobs since then. I was a high school principal, a youth village for children at risk uh, principal, uh, general manager. I um, 
I was head of uh, CEO of men of several uh, non-profit organizations. One of them was a very unique one. It was called Budo for Peace. It was martial arts for peace. And what mm -hmm. that organization did is uh, created friendships uh, from uh, between Palestinians and Israelis, Jordanians, Turks, uh, and all kinds of religions in Israel, within Israel, boys and girls, uh, through an educational program based on the values of martial arts. You know, martial arts have uh, about the same values. They have respect, uh, not to use uh, the excess power, uh, etc. Et so those were the, the values that uh, were leading the educational program of this uh, NGO. And in the last seven, eight, nine years, I am a coach. I am a life coach. I am an organizational coach, leadership coach. Um, I work with the Ministry of Education, with companies and with private people that want to change their lives. Do you work by, are you like an entrepreneur or do you work for another company? No, I'm, I'm a freelance. I'm a freelance. Uh, I do all sorts of works with uh, other uh, colleagues, but in general, I'm a, a one man one man show. Well, you're in an this amazing. last job, yeah. You are quite an amazing man. Could you tell me a little about your feeling about friendship? Because you seem very passionate about it, mm -hmm. and so am I. So I want. Mm -hmm. Talk to you about it a little. Well, you know, friendship is something that uh, you recognize it when you don't speak to somebody for 10 years and then all of a sudden he calls you or you call him or you meet in the street and you sit down and you continue the conversation like you have never gone apart. So, and the other component of friendship is that someone that you can call up at three o'clock at night and tell them that you want them to come over right now without explaining what happened and they will jump in the car and come. That's friendship. So, and I do have some friends like that, that I am friends with them, that they will tell me, come here and I will go, just go there, don't ask questions, just drive there or whatever needs to be done. And uh, we will, we will, deal with whatever needs to be dealt with without asking questions uh, uh, that's that's friendship for me that's friendship to me when did you begin to develop those type of friendships uh, from childhood uh, from romania some of my friends from the childhood um, when we left romania it was a socialist country so it was very hard to live and we were refused for 14 years, etc. But when we left, I did not, we left in a rush. And I did not have the chance to say goodbyes, to take my goodbyes from my very best childhood friends, which was very traumatic. But uh, we were able to keep uh, some connections via letters for a couple of years. But when they started to come to after two, three years, when they were close to military, to join the military in Romania, all our ties were disconnected because of political reasons there and here, mostly there. And uh, they were forced to cut their uh, friendships uh, and ties and connection with me. And I happened to find them when traveling there for the first time after 30 years. And and yeah, and it, it, it and I didn't meet all of them. I met one or two. One of them died since uh, because life is tough there. But uh, some of them, I I even today, thanks to Facebook and other uh, social media platforms, I uh, I find them every now and then. Even people that I forgot, I just found uh, we found each other. Uh, uh, a year ago, less than a year ago, with somebody in Colorado that was in my class. So, and, and I didn't speak with him 50 years. 
And after 50 years, one night he called me, 50 years, I didn't know he, he lived. After 50 years, we picked up the phone, we found each other via Facebook, and we started to talk like we parted yesterday. So it's something that was there all the time. I love your definition of friendship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm pretty much the same way. Mm -hmm. I would like to know how you feel friendship can help develop peace in the world. I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example from Buddha for Peace, from that uh, non-profit that uh, I was the CEO of. Uh, we deliberately chose to do an educational program based on the values of martial arts. Why? Because, because of two things. One, because we chose to focus on the common things and not on the differences. We knew what we don't agree with the Palestinians, with the Jordanians, uh, with the Turks. We knew. So we didn't go there. So we chose to focus on things that we know that are safe and good. And second, those values of martial arts are values of honor, of uh, abstinence, of using power uh, properly, etc. So these and these are universal in all the all the traditional martial arts. You go to judo, aikido, karate, taekwondo. They all have a do at the ending, which is the way in Japanese. And the way is always a way of the warrior, which is respect, abstinence, uh, proper use of force, and, and nine, ten more values. So we chose to, to build our educational program on fun, on friendship, and on secure, safe values. So that kept us going into the right direction. And now to answer your question more directly, when when you respect each other and when you really love each other unconditionally you can overcome differences we, you can accept easier that i think like that and you think like that maybe we even know that we will not be able to resolve our differences um, but uh, thank you Salman. but uh, at least we have a deep respect and even when we fight or we quarrel, we do that with respect. And we know that after we yell, we will come back and hug each other. And that, that is something that is a safe ground that can help us resolve conflict. When we don't respect the other guy, uh, then, then it's not going to happen. Uh, one, of, one of these friendships that I started to build with a gentleman in Pakistan, started off uh, not so well, because because I I took a peek into his website, and I saw that there was no acknowledgement of the existence of the state of Israel. He had a map showing that there's no Israel on it. It was only Palestine. It was not even saying Palestine. It was saying only Haifa, Jaffa, etc. And for me, that was a tough one because the beginning of any friendship is to say, hey, I recognize that you're a human being. You recognize that I'm a human being and we both agree that we have the right to be safe, peaceful, to live in peace and to uh, secure a future for our kids. When I joined the military, I was hoping that by my service in the army, I never planned to be 22 years, never ever. And I left the military twice and came back twice. But I never, never thought that I will spend uh, 22 years in total in the military. But I was hoping that by me doing that, my kids will not have to fight. My kids will not have to go into the army. And of course it was wrong, although they are girls and they were not in fighting units, but they still had to go to the military. And now, um, 40 years later, I'm hoping that my grandkids, who now are 
seven and five and a half and two months, I do hope that maybe maybe they will not have to fight or go into battle or be in the military. Uh, I hope that they will experience friendship and love and peace. So I believe that friendship can help. It's not enough, but it's a very a strong weapon uh, in fighting for peace, if one can say so. Being friends helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Why do you say it's not enough? Because uh, I'm I'm a, I'm aware that not not that of two things. One that not not everything is on our hands. What I call the simple people. There are politicians. There are heads of state. They, there are interests, there is money, there is power, there is a, a hatred. There's a lot of things involved in the big geopolitics. Uh, so uh, it will take an enormous amount of friendship between a huge amount of people in the world to be enough to create peace. Uh, the second reason uh, that I say that it's not enough is because I'm looking at the human nature. And human nature shows us that humanity has learned very little from history. And uh, today there are no less wars than there used to be 50 years ago and 100 years ago and 1,000 years ago. There's no difference between, only the weaponry changed. Uh, there's no the difference between what happened in America with the Indians or uh, in uh, Jerusalem with the Romans or in Pakistan with the Indians, uh, vice versa, or World War I and two and the 100-year war and the 30-year war and the Kashmir war and the Palestinian war and the Israeli-Arab wars. We learned nothing as uh, states, as humanity in general. So, yeah, I, I believe that the friendship is extremely important but it's not enough. Do you think... Um, see, I kind of disagree here, because I'm I think sure. friendship mm -hmm. brings people together. I think if, if it hadn't been for the Institute of Peace, Israel and Palestine, granted there aren't many Palestinians coming, that meetup wouldn't be happening. Yeah, that's true. That, that is true. But, but I'm talking about the big picture. Do you see in the world leadership, in the heads of states, do you see some real friends, generally speaking? No. You see politicians, you see politics, you see interests, you see money, oil, uh, weaponry, uh, atom bombing, etc. Uh, so yes, it's very important that we can uh, share. I had last night a chat with my beautiful, lovely, wonderful friend, a new friend that I met through uh, this program. Uh, you know who I mean, in uh, Khan Yunus. Uh, Dalia. Dalia, she was on the Zoom. Okay. Now I and, and it was a heartwarming, beautiful discussion. Uh, she's a fantastic, wonderful human being, and I'm blessed to be able to to reach out to her. But is it enough uh, to 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 create peace? Uh, it's a little bit too high. I do hope. I do. I do it. I do it because it's important. Because I believe in it. Uh, I'll tell you, in 1995, or a, a, a little before, when all the peace agreements, the first peace agreements were done between Israel and uh, other uh, nations, I strongly believed I was very optimistic, and many, many people in Israel were very, very optimistic. As the same, in the same way that we are very, very happy now uh, with this. Uh, uh, new agreement with the, the Emirates and the, with big hopes that many other Arab countries will follow. Uh, but I'm not even half as optimistic 
as I used to be in 95, 94. In 95, Itzhak Rabin was murdered by a Jew uh, because of his peace dreams. And he he reached out uh, a hand to, with a hand for peace for many others. And Sadat reached out for peace to us uh, from Egypt. And those were wonderful times and very, very hopeful times. And now I'm much more, uh, much less optimistic about the future. With COVID-19, mm-hmm. you and I would have never met because we're using the internet. You are thousands of miles away from Washington, D.C. Yeah. The whole world has become smaller because we're we're connected using the internet. And boundaries between countries are being deleted because of the internet. Do you think there's any chance that the internet can just unite everyone together and people can begin talking to each other and becoming friends. Well, uh, the, the internet certainly helps. But if, if you mentioned COVID, I think that COVID-19 and similar plagues and uh, pandemics have a better chance to make us united. If there is a lesson learned from this pandemic is, and it's something that I work on very intensively now, also to try to make some sort of business opportunities, but mostly as a message. I think that the message of COVID-19 is that we must, must cooperate on a very large scale. Now, coaches like myself and uh, uh, all sorts of uh, consultants, the organizational consultants, they know how to create, and I know too very well, how to create teamwork at the level of an organization or of a thousand people or 5,000 people, etc. But the humanity did not figure out yet how to cooperate on a very large scale. And uh, the message of this pandemic is we must must cooperate on a very large human scale in order to uh, take out poverty, in order to finish the wars, in order to uh, to, to stop AIDS, uh, etc. And uh, maybe to stop radicalism of all sorts. So yes, there is hope, but the uh, internet helps. Yeah, that's a great thing that helps. But I think that uh, internet is only the means. It's not the reason. It's only the means that helps. But uh, COVID and uh, similar plagues and the pandemics have the potential to wake us up and say, hey, guys, we need to act differently. Look what happened in the world. The whole world just halted. The whole world, the whole planet is on a lockdown, an unprecedented, unprecedented lockdown. So I uh, do hope that there will be no more pandemics, but I'm afraid there will be. And I do hope that we'll be smart enough to use the internet, uh, good hearts, good people around the world to start talking to each other because that's wonderful. Do you believe the world is becoming a better place using the internet? Well, yes. Yeah, I think, yes. I think that uh, in general, using the internet, we become a better place. Although, although, you know that in many places, uh, in many corners of the world, uh, internet is used in order to to spread hatred. Lots of, lots of, lots of hatred spread out very easily thanks to the internet. So the internet is neutral. It's just like atom, atomic energy can be used for electricity, for science, and for killing people. And all the new technology can be used, the uh, biochemicals uh, chem- for chemical warfare and biological uh, warfare uh, and weaponry. They all can be used for science, for peace, and for hatred. And it depends on the mindset and on people and on 
understanding what we want and where we want to go as to how it will be used. Internet in itself will not make peace or war, but bad people use it for bad things and good people use it for wonderful things. Do you think that this is a time where more positivity will come into play? I certainly hope so. I'm not sure, but I, I, I think that there are some signs, but I'm, who am I to tell? Uh, I certainly do hope because right now, for example, all this time is th this, this, uh, pandemic time is like, like a halt between what was before and what will be after. And uh, I hope that most of us will be smart enough to use it to improve the world, but I'm not sure. I certainly do hope and I will do all my best to improve the world around me, uh, but I'm not sure that that's what's going to happen. Why? Because, uh, because there are people who don't want to learn People don't want to make peace. People don't want to listen to, to facts. People, uh, it's easier to hate than to love. Uh, you know, you don't, in order to love someone, you need to make an effort. You sometimes have to, to overcome their accent, their knowledge, their uh, level of internet connection, how they look like, how they talk. Uh, you, you have to make an effort to create friendship. You don't have to make an effort to, uh, to hate. If Israel saw Pakistan only 20, we should finish Israel. Well, there's a good example for that. Hafiz, I'm, I'm inviting you to, to talk to me and uh, hopefully I will be able to to show you some uh, light uh, or some things in other light. Uh, there are many other colors, but uh, as you say, as you see, there are people who, I don't know where they learned their facts, but uh, um, they don't necessarily care for the facts or for the historical facts. In one of the talks, somebody mentioned in one of the Zoom talks, the first one maybe that I participated, somebody said, no, one of, one of the guys interviewed me and he said, uh, let's focus on how we solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict right now and let's start from now. I said, look, that's okay to start from now. There are a lot of things that we must uh, solve now and there are a lot of things that are wrong now on both sides, on both sides. But you cannot disconsider the past. You have to know the past you have to learn the past, you have to know the data, you have to know the history and take it all into consideration. And then take into consideration the, the, the present and then build the common future. But you cannot ignore the past, like who was here first or what was, uh, what was the history of this people and that people. So I think we have to respect the present and respect all people involved uh, in conflicts all around the world but we have to know the past, we have to understand the past, and we have to build a common future. There's no question about that. Um, so, you know, there are people who, there are ignorant people, there are smart people, there are lots of people with good hearts all over the world, and there are a lot of people who do bad things all over the world to their own people and to other people as well. Right. It's a tough one. And it really is determined on the mindset. If someone wants to see positivity, they're going to see it. If someone wants to see negatively, they'll mm -hmm. see it. But the reality is we all breathe the same air, which is the essence of our life, and there's no boundary. Where are the yeah. boundaries? And, and by the way, I don't remember exactly the comment of uh, the last gentleman that you brought up, but if you can show it again, maybe, or even if not, if you can show it, please show it. Yeah. I uh, yeah. There is, uh, we have only one Allah, and absolutely, absolutely that Allah, whatever the, his name is, and if he exists, he's the same one for Pakistanis, Jews, uh, Christians, 
Hindus, it's the same Allah. Uh, so there's no differences. Uh, it's all the same. Uh, there's no there's no five gods, different gods. There's no five. There's no Christian Allah and Jewish Allah and Hindu and Buddhist Allah. They are all the same, and uh, and we are all the same. We just are taller or fatter or younger or older. Um, and by the way, Pakistan has the same same issues and same problems that Israel has. And I'm not sure that uh, that Hafiz or anybody else would want to hear that Pakistan is going off the map or it doesn't exist or things like that. Uh, and I think that it all starts with us respecting uh, the other guy's right to live safely in peace with his kids forever. Thank you, Mariam. Mariam, that's true. Mm -hmm. Humanity yeah. has no boundaries except yeah. human values. There are no boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I like her next comment. Collective consciousness has one mind. Well, that's that's an interesting one. That's a very interesting one. Uh, I'm writing now an article uh, following those lessons, following up on the lessons learned from the COVID. It is, you know, there is a, what Viktor Frankl uh, coined, uh, the founder of logotherapy and the uh, Holocaust survivor uh, in the camps. He coined the term meaning of life. And he coined the sentence that if you have a why, you can live through any how. Meaning that if you have a good purpose or a purpose in, in general, then you can uh, overcome any difficulties. And that brings me to, to something that I think now in the light of COVID pandemic, we need a collective meaning of life. And we, if we and Hafiz and everybody else would have this collective consciousness uh, in our mind, we uh, would make peace in a second. Uh, all over the world with no boundaries. And I'm sure that the same way that I want my kids and grandkids to live in peace, and I want Dalia's kids and uh, grandkids uh, to, be, to, to, to come to live in complete peace and uh, luxury and good life in Gaza, the same I wish to Hafiz in Pakistan or to his friends in India and in Kashmir and in the Himalayas, and in Tibet, and uh, in Iraq, and uh, everywhere else. Because everybody wants just to live a good life, a normal life, uh, to enjoy their family, their kids, uh, to enjoy good health, and to be happy. And everyone, everyone deserves that, whether they are Palestinian, or Pakistanis, or Romanian, or uh, Jews, or whatever. And the reason for these interviews is to bring people to the knowledge, whether you like the person or not, we all yeah. want the same thing. I'll tell you, you know, it's something very, very interesting. Um, three, four weeks ago, when we never even heard yet of the, of the new uh, agreement uh, with the United Arab Emirates, uh, Rihan put me online uh, with 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 somebody, it was a gentleman from the Emirates, and uh, he asked for my friendship on Facebook. Now, because my Facebook is in Hebrew, I advise people to contact me via LinkedIn to join the international friendship group that I established on Facebook and to chat there, share ideas there. Uh, and also to save some time because on one on one it's impossible uh, to there are so many people that want to talk and want to interview and it's very hard and uh, so he asked for my friendship so I, and i said hi it's a pleasure to meet you and he said where are you from and i said where i'm from and he was the one who asked for friendship and when i told him where i am from he said that he hated israel and uh, he also uh, uh, advised me what to do uh, in a world that starts with F. 
And uh, I said, okay, that's fine. And we continued to chat. It was late in the night. We continued to chat on Messenger. And after half an hour, we parted as friends in spite of how it began, really. And uh, now, after the agreement with the UAE uh, became a reality, a, a big surprise, I chatted uh, with him again and I said, well, how are you and how do you feel about this? And he said, wow, great. So, yeah, there is uh, hope after all. Right. And that's the whole point of the work that I do with Rayhan. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, sure. Mm -hmm. And that's why we do it and why we continue doing it. Yeah. Nice saying, Mariam. And everyone, and that's so true. Everyone yeah. has a purpose. Well, not everybody is aware of it. And uh, a lot of people live half or most or sometimes all of their life not knowing, not understanding what their purpose is. And uh, then when they come to the end of life, sometimes they say, hey, wait a minute, but wh what was all this? And why was it? So, uh, yeah, we do have a purpose. I'm uh, very much aware of my my purpose. And uh, I was not aware 10 years ago, I had no clue that I have a purpose in life. Although I did behave all the time according to that same purpose, but I was not aware. And I was already 50 or 55. And um, when I was 54, uh, my wife and I did something very interesting. We, um, we left our jobs. Uh, we rented out our home. We put all our furniture and belongings into a room. And we put uh, backpacks on our back. And we left for almost a whole year traveling to the Far East and Europe and all around. And there's many friendships that we built. There's a lot of perspectives that we learned and we changed our lives. We became uh, freelance and not uh, hired, uh, not working for a salary from the time when we come back. It was in 2011. So it was uh, life-changing. It, it was a life-changing experience. And the beautiful places that we went to visit uh, uh, everyday normal people uh, Buddhists, uh, non-Buddhists, uh, Vietnamese, uh, Cambodian, uh, Burmese, uh, Europeans. Uh, we made lifetime friendships with them. And uh, so, yeah, there is hope. There's more hope. I don't know if I want to call it hope or more knowledge of what can be done in the world if only people would open up their mind a little more and mm -hmm. see the world. I mean, there's positivity and negativity. If you look at the negative, you'll see only that. If yeah. you look at the positive, that's when you'll begin seeing the positive. And another well, it, it's not an easy task. Yeah, that that's uh, you're right, Mariam. The uh, or, or another way to say it, only uh, the lesson uh, the lesson happens only when the student is ready, not before. Smart lady. Very smart. She's on my mind for panel now, and I feel honored to have her. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I know that you said keep it up for 30 minutes, and we are definitely over 30 minutes, Knuckle. Can we maybe continue this another time? Of course, with great pleasure. Into it. Thank with you. With great pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. I know that we are above, far from the time we had agreed upon now. So I do want you to go and I want to thank you for being here and speaking with me today. I thank you for listening and for your wonderful questions and for what you do in order to spread knowledge, love and respect uh, to many corners of the world. So I am the one who thanks you. Thank you very much. And I thank you very, very much.
And with that, I want to remind everyone this show is sponsored by the Institute of Peace, where we encourage peace one conversation at a time. Let's wave goodbye. Bye bye. Shalom. Going right. Shalom aleichem. Shalom aleichem. Salam alaikum. <laughs> May peace be upon you. And we're going to conversation. Amen. Thank you very much. Bye.